Welcome so much to our technical assistance session for the greater, Clo greater COVID-19 greater COVID greater Cleveland COVID-19 Rapid Response Fund. Thank you so much for joining us. And we hope you all are safe and healthy during these, during these times. We have some slides to share with you to talk about our process in phase two of our COVID fund. And Dan Cohen is my partner in crime here. He's gonna share his slides with us. So as many of you know, in March um, of this year, uh, we formed the Greater Cleveland COVID-19 Rapid Response Fund. It was a response from the philanthropic community and individual donors to support our region around COVID. Within one week of them closing the schools and the, of the first reported case in Ohio, our local philanthropic community had established this fund. We're really proud that with the help of a lot of donors, uh, foundations and individuals, we raised almost $9 million with 80 partners, over 2,300 individual donors. And out of those donations over four months, we gave out uh, grants to 161 nonprofits in our region. And our region is both Cuyahoga, Lake and Geauga counties. And then we also gave small grants, grants through Neighborhood Connections to another 130 smaller organizations. So I wanna say on this call, thank you to all of the foundations and corporations and individuals who supported the fund. And um, thank you to Neighborhood Connections for serving as a, a partner with us to support small grants. I uh, didn't chime in before I should have to say hello. Uh, my name is Dan Cohen and I serve as Vice President of Strategy with the Mount Sinai Healthcare Foundation. I'm really happy to be here and sharing some information about the fund. So um, after our four months of adventure, if you could call it that. Um, funders from the first part of our rapid response fund came together and thought, what have we learned? What do we know? What's gonna be different? How is this uh, coronavirus pandemic going to evolve over time? And in what ways do we need to show up? In what ways do we need to change this fund? Do we need to launch a second fund to begin with? Um, any number of questions sort of existentially about the rapid response fund. We hired our colleagues Heather Lenz at St. Croix Strategy and Monique Williams Kelly at the engagement group to help us with some community engagement, some data collection and analysis to inform our strategy. That phase one analysis comprised of what you see on the screen. Um, importantly here, we wanted to point out that a lot of this was really driven by a lot of our strategy for this second phase that you'll hear a little bit more about in depth today was driven by what we heard from you. Um, we heard from, in addition to 312 surveys from community residents, um, more than half identified as people of color. Uh, and this was spread geographically across greater Cleveland. It was primarily in Cuyahoga County, but we heard from a lot of different folks. We also heard from 314 nonprofit leaders who thankfully uh, and gratefully took time out of their busy calendars to share with us written feedback to a response or rather a request for information that we um, made public in July. Um, as part of that analysis, we learned quite a bit. I won't share everything on the slide. You can certainly come back to the recording later and, and read this in some more depth. And we've posted um, those reports, I believe, um, publicly at this point. If not, we will shortly. But we asked nonprofit leaders to share with us what the three to five year impact of COVID is likely to be on their organization. And they said things like, we're shifting all of our programming or most of our programming to a digital platforms um, for health partners in particular. You know, as they said, we're, we're really taking advantage of new opportunities in telehealth, telepractice. Um, we heard a lot from nonprofit partners. They would need investment in capacity building, that they really need to develop not only the systems and structures and monetary investments, but they also need to develop a new set of skills and a new knowledge base to pivot their organization's programming as well as their operations to this new digital structure. We asked as well among our nonprofit partners about systemic barriers to their success. And they said a lot of things and, and there's some, some detail here in the report, um, but you'll see on the screen um, the pervasive issue of poverty and its connection to unmet basic needs among our nonprofit partners' clients rose to the top. Of course, deeply connected to structural inequities um, and racism and um, also related to one another were what you see on the right side of your screen, um, funding structures and restrictions from um, grant making partners that made it difficult for nonprofits to do the work that they needed to do to meet those basic needs 
and that government systems and more importantly, government funding structures were difficult to navigate, were hard to manage, reporting structures weren't very useful or, or weren't conducive to efficient deployment of dollars. And all of this, of course, couched in the context that nonprofits were anticipating a reduced um, operational budget, that they were, they were experiencing reduced volunteers, reduced fundraising, um, fewer individual donors, et cetera. And all of that led us to what you see at the bottom and what you'll see on this next slide are a focus on, for phase two, a continued focus on philanthropic partners investing in COVID response, meaning continuing to meet people's basic needs and support the nonprofits at the front lines who are doing that. An ongoing and long-term commitment to racial justice and dismantling racial inequities and a focus on economic mobility and economic well-being for people on the ground, community residents who are served by our nonprofit partners. What does that meant? Well, it has meant that our funding collaborative, which is at previously a small group of funders getting together, actually a large group of funders, but a, a fairly um, small group of funders actually coming together on a regular basis, reviewing grant proposals, inviting grant proposals, and then making decisions to deploy resources very quickly. What you see here is sort of a, an amalgamation, a, a recasting of that strategy to focus both on that immediate response, that COVID-19 response you saw from the previous slide, as well as two other working groups, again, of collaborative funders coming together to focus on specific mission-driven um, strategies. That response work group Dale will talk about here in just a little bit, and I will just give you a highlight here of the adaptation and recovery work groups also at the next slide. I just wanna mention that at the center of your screen, you see a strategy team. That is the connective tissue across all three of these working groups. These are different working groups of funders. Again, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but it's important to note for us and, and we hope for you that one of the things we're really proud of is that our strategy team, the people who are really driving the engine from behind the scenes are mostly non-funders. So we've got five funders. It's a group of 15 or 17 at this point. We've got five funders at the table. These are mostly nonprofit leaders who are helping us devise what, what philanthropy should be doing. Some of them are grantees of phase one. Many of them are not. Um, some of them are, are steeped in the basic needs uh, and, and uh, human services. Some of them are not. And all of this, of course, is kept, all of this apparatus is couched in a community advisory council, which we are just in the earliest phases of planning and, and likely to launch here shortly. And you can see our commitments on the outside, our, our um, values and guiding principles, and particularly our commitment to racial equity at the top. I'll just briefly hit on each of those three working groups and then I will hand it over to Dale to give you a little bit more information on what we're here to talk about today, which is that response work group. That work group launched just recently in October. It is a pooled fund, meaning those organized philanthropists, those organizational uh, grant making entities have come together, put money into a single pot, thanks to the Cleveland Foundation's extraordinary leadership and Dale's extraordinary leadership with a focus on the next 12 months and supporting nonprofit partners, again, at the front lines, meeting basic human needs and responding to the pandemic. Central to that work, as Dale will talk about in just a minute, is the prevention of transmission of disease. I won't talk here, Dale will hit on that a little bit more. What I wanna share with you just at a high level is those other two working groups. Those are largely driven by a, long, a medium and longer term vision for both the nonprofit sector and our community resiliency. The adaptation work group, as you see on the screen, is in, is in development. Um, that's sort of a medium term uh, set of strategies and principles around which interested funders come together and align or coordinate their funds. They're not necessarily creating a pooled fund per se. They may end up choosing to do that, but they will align strategies, perhaps co-invite proposals, perhaps release RFPs or RFQs um, to get nonprofits to, to respond to targeted issues. And the focus of the adaptation work group is capacity building throughout the nonprofit sector, especially those that were negatively impacted by COVID. The last work group, and then I'll come up for air here, is that recovery work group. And again, this one's also in development, but this is a long-term, there's kind of no end in sight per se for this one, but this is really that focus on those second two pieces of the puzzle that you saw on the screen two, two slides ago, the racial justice and dismantling racial inequities and the long-term strategy around economic well-being and economic mobility. This again would be a, a coordinated fund or aligned funds with a long-term timeframe. And this will also focus philanthropy on policy and advocacy. That's really where um, we heard from our funding colleagues as well as from our nonprofit partners where they would see the biggest bang for their buck on those issues related to anti-racism. So I'll hand it over to Dale here to talk in some more detail about that response. Please, I got a tape. Uh-oh, I'm sorry? <laughs> no, all good. Oh, you're on mute, Dale. 
I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Dale Franklin. I'm the program director for Youth Health and Human Services at the Cleveland Foundation. <laughs> Um, so we're going to talk about the response work group in particular, and that's the that's the group that um, some of you are probably going to be applying for funding. Next slide. Um, we have settled on using. So let's be clear: the main part of this fund is to make sure that we can support organizations so that we can all stay healthy in this pandemic. We want to help flatten the curve. We want to have people stay home if they have to. We want to support organizations that have to support our clients and our residents in order for everybody to be safe. And so we're always guided by the public health guidelines. And we revisit those guidelines and everything that's happening literally sometimes daily. And we sometimes make changes in our strategy based on what's happening. So we've settled on, um, like we did in, in phase one, really supporting basic needs, services to support those basic needs. And this is just an example, things like housing stability supports. We gave money very early on to help depopulate the homeless shelters. We supported a number of organizations in the past around mental and behavioral health because we know this is so hard on everybody. We also, um, like phase one, we're continuing in phase two to support PPE, uh, personal protection equipment, testing, contact tracing, and now hopefully vaccination, um, um, getting a vaccinate, vac vac vaccinations out into the community. So any groups that are doing that, particularly in the community, we're not supporting the large healthcare institutions necessarily to do that. We want to make sure our community organizations have access to all of that. And then we've added on for phase two the term family supports, because we know children, families are having a hard time managing through this pandemic, because it's also an economic uh, situation. And so things to help secure employment, to help children thrive in schools, anything around distance learning, um, we've been supporting things like that, technology, getting so that, so that all of our organizations can focus on technology and use that to support our clients. Next up, next slide. So we have a few differences from phase one. Um, in, phase, in phase two, we, we, we raised almost $9 million in phase one. We've got a little over $3 million raised in phase two. We are expecting more dollars, but you're never quite sure exactly what's coming in. And so we're looking to support more grantees, probably with smaller grants so that we can get out to more um, uh, more neighborhoods and more uh, regions in our, in, our, in our region. We have more of a focus in phase two on equity and racial justice. It was very clear with the data coming out of phase one over these past few months that this is hitting black and brown communities, low income communities, particularly demographics, LGBTQ communities, um, refugee communities. It's hitting them very hard for all sorts of different reasons. So we wanna have more of an emphasis on supporting those groups in phase two. We definitely have invited more people to our table. There were a few of us funders really deciding what was gonna go, what was gonna be supported in phase one. We've invited, and you'll see at the end, a much broader range of reviewers, fun, mostly funders, but not exclusively, to bring a broader, broader perspective to this issue. And then finally, we, we happened on this in phase one, we're more intentional about it in phase two, is that we're encouraging collaborative grants. We know there are a number of sectors where every organization in the sector is facing the same types of issues. And so refugee groups have come into us together. Some of the behavioral group, behavioral organizations that work with those types of groups came into us together for PPE. So we're encouraging those types of collaborative grants. Next slide. And then when it comes to eligibility, we are, as we said, funding in Cuyahoga, Lake, and Geauga counties. You do have to be a 501c3 in order to receive the grants um, or fiscally sponsored by someone who's a 501c3. And we have had the question and the answer is yes. You can apply for your, your own organization, but you could also apply as a fiscal agent for somebody else. We've had people do that. Um, we are encouraging groups of where you have an operating budget of less than 20 million to apply. Um, more than that, usually you have more resources to pull on. And then we are absolutely taking applications again from organizations that we funded in phase one because we know your work is not is continuing. Oh, I think this one's mine. 
Um, so I'll just briefly walk through the mechanics. This, we'll, we'll fly through this because a lot of this information is already available on the website. But suffice to say that our basic process is on an every two week basis. If you were a grantee of phase one, you may recall that we were making grants on a weekly basis. That pace, even for superheroes like Dale, uh, proved to be insane. <laughs> and so we have since rolled that back and have found a regular cadence to be useful, frankly, both for the funders as well as for grantee partners. Um, so we will be, as I mentioned, reviewing on a biweekly basis. And the basic process is this. We'll receive a batch of grants compiled by our, our consulting partners I mentioned previously. Those will be dispersed to different review committees. They will do due diligence. So if you applied for a fund, or excuse me, if you applied for a grant, you may very well get a phone call from one of the people who's reviewing a grant, asking questions, seeking more clarification. Um, and then ultimately we make decisions. And in that group of um, folks making those recommendations that you'll see in just a moment, basically operate like a mini foundation among foundations. We, as a small team, make a series of recommendations and those recommendations are basically not only about that one small grant in and of itself, but about how that grant is positioned relative to all the other proposals that have come in, what our budget looks like, what dollars we have left. And we make recommendations then to all of the funders who are part of the collaborative and they ultimately vote on what dollars go out the door. There are basically three different um, ways that we might respond to a grant request. We might fund it. We might hold it for up to two cycles. So up to, I think, is that six weeks total or four weeks total? Four Dale? weeks. Four weeks total. Um, or we could decline it. Um, and I think we'll talk about declining in just a little bit as well, what, what that means. Just so you're aware, um, here are the dates for payout for the, for the rest of 2020. Um, so if you get an application in today, um, our, our first grant decision based on those applications that were submitted before or up until today will be on December 3rd. Our next um, submission, so between November 17th and December 1st, um, the next grant decision date would be December 17th. Um, it's important to know you're probably looking at the clock saying, oh my God, like we, there's, a, <laughs> there's a deadline today. Our, our proposals are submitted or rather are received on a rolling basis. Um, so no worries if you get it in tomorrow, that's okay. It'll just be pushed to the next grant cycle. Um, it's also important to note that we, one of the things that we carried over intentionally from the first phase was a process that was as user-friendly and as easy to get through for busy nonprofits as possible. So the proposal process itself remains three or four questions. And um, we've added, as Dale mentioned before, some more questions about racial equity and demographics of organization prefer. But by and large, this is a pretty straightforward set of four or five questions that you should be able to get through, no problem. Dale, I think you were gonna take the first stab here at frequently asked questions. Yep, so I mentioned that we're encouraging groups of operating budgets of less than $20 million to apply. Um, if you're seeking a relatively small grant, particularly $5,000 and under, um, we're probably gonna be sending you over to Neighborhood Connections. Um, they are supporting grants of $5,000 or under. Dan, you're up next. Oh, um, let's see. Typical what will grant size. Grant size? Yeah, um, so we actually don't have a typical grant size. We know that from our first phase, uh, and sorry, I was texting my dog walker who's trying to enter my home right now. Um, <laughs> we, um, we are, the average grant size from phase one was $64,000. And we found when we did an analysis of 24 other funds across the country that actually we were, we, our average grant size was much larger than what other similarly situated funds were doing. That's not necessarily bad. In fact, I, we would defend our work. But as Dale said, our budget is quite small relative to phase one. And we know that there were perhaps many organizations that um, were providing those direct frontline services that might need some support this time around. So um, it is likely that grant sizes will be a little bit smaller than what we, what we made happen in phase one um, so that we can continue to spread uh, resources equitably. And um, it, it, you are allowed to apply if you are located physically outside of the three counties, but you need to be serving residents within one of those three counties. Great. Next slide. So there's a lot more information on the Cleveland Foundation website. This is the, um, this is the uh, site to go to that. Um, there's a lot of information on how to donate, also how to apply to get a grant. And then here are our response work group members. Um, we represent quite a range of foundations in the space um, in, our, in our counties. 
Um, and we're really pleased and grateful that they agreed to do this because this is extra work on top of their normal day job. And we meet several times a week. So <laughs> this is a lot of extra work. And then we wanna thank our contributing partners to the fund in phase two. Um, all of course, thanks to the ones in phase one. These are the ones who have given so far to phase two. We know there are others ready to come in, especially in January, 2021, when we have a new grant budget. Um, but this, if you see people from these, fund, from these foundations, please do thank them for their support. And while you keep that up, we're gonna answer some of the questions um, that come in through the chat. And so um, one question is, I was funded in phase one, but I did not get all of the dollars I asked for. Why is that? And that's partly because we have had to share, spread the wealth. Um, we have a lot of needs in our community. We're not able to usually fund at the maximum amount that people have asked for. And so we try really hard to go with um, supporting the, the, the main need that you have, and then frankly, trying to share um, so that we can spread our dollars to a larger number of organizations. So it, it, it often has nothing to do with the merit of your grant request or that line item. It is that we cannot give $100,000 to every organization that applies to us. We have to figure out a way to spread those dollars over a large number of organizations. Dan, you wanna take the next one? Sure, actually, Dale, um, the question about community, you have a really good kind of three-step definition of different ways that right. we do community. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So as we are putting together our community advisory council, we've been thinking long and hard actually about that term community. And we are looking for a mixture of people um, and we kind of think of them around um, lived experience, right? People who live in our community and are living day to day with um, you know, whatever issues that they're dealing with. We're thinking of um, what, who people have designated as leaders in their community, right? Um, sometimes you consider yourself a leader or others consider you a leader. Um, and so you have both a lived experience and you have this kind of leadership background or inclination or people have seen you in that space or you've demonstrated that space in some way. We're looking for those types of people. And then we always are looking for on our community advisory council, people who are quote um, experts, but not necessarily have spent 30 years in the field. Um, just are, you know, are maybe not the CEO or the executive director of an organization, but are working in an organization and really understand that particular field or that neighborhood. Um, and so we're looking for, we're going to be looking for a range of people. I think we're trying to seat about 10 to 12 people on that community advisory council. And we're, we're still working on all the parameters of that. Yeah. And the strategy team will be building that out. I, I think it's safe to say at this point, just in terms of our values and the values of the COVID fund that we are looking for disproportionate representation from people of color, um, yes. from refugee and immigrant communities, from yes. those communities that are hardest hit by COVID. And our, our, the intention behind this community advisory committee is, you know, we, we know that that term is, is well played um, and perhaps diluted, uh, you know, in Cleveland and in other communities. Um, it's our opportunity, frankly, to do things a little bit differently. Um, to not hear from the same voices. And, and to be clear, we love hearing and we desperately need to hear from our systems leaders, from, from our executives of, of large nonprofits, but that's, that's not really the space for this, uh, for this community advisory council. We're really looking to, to bring together a group of voices that maybe not are, are, are not necessarily heard so loudly or so frequently, but um, who, who are directly connected to this issue of COVID. Um, I can take the next one, Dale, and you want to yes. uh, chime in with me here. So there's a question in the chat, are general operating grants okay, or are you looking for project grants? Um, I would, my first stab at this is that we, we are typically not going line by line within proposed budgets and saying, we'll fund this, we're not going to fund that, we'll fund this, we'll, we're not going to fund that. So it isn't project specific in that way. However, we are not looking to backfill. Um, you know, reduced income or reduced revenue as a result of a fundraiser that was canceled or that or, or those types of things. Um, we are we are looking for projects, programs, and services that are specific to responding to COVID 
and to the extent possible, preventing the transmission of disease. Now, as Dale mentioned before, you know, we're, we're giving out these dollars and we trust that our nonprofit partners are going to spend them the way that they uh, said in their proposal that they will be spending, but this will not be um, the sort of line by line budget audit that you would probably experience in a typical kind of foundation um, communique. Anything I missed there, Dale? No, I think that's good. We, and we purposely tried to make the application process shorter than we normally would do with most of our foundations. We're trying, you see, we're definitely making it quicker. Um, we are asking that you not send in multiple grant applications. Um, the grant period for phase two is one year. And so if you apply now um, and you get funded in December, for example, you would, as of now, unless something changes and we get a lot more money in, you would not be allowed to apply again in that one year time frame. And so we ask then that you prioritize and pick your highest priority and submit one application. Um, for whatever focus area. We understand some of you work, work on multiple issues, but we would like you to pick your priority area to send to us. The other thing, can I just add one more thing, Dale, to that, that yes. I'm realizing? Um, as we are looking to launch the adaptation work group, it is yes. likely that some of those issues, more systemic issues of the nonprofit sector, um, you know, whether that's general operating or otherwise, that there is going to be space for ongoing conversation among foundations who are involved in that adaptation space um, to be thinking about other other ways of funding um, in response to COVID. And let me add also that um, one of the benefits of having multiple foundations around our COVID table is that we are able to share with them all of the grants that come into us. And so like in phase one, we considered grant applications through the COVID fund, but we also shared that with all of our funding partners and some partners, some of our grantees were able to get funded through a normal process at another foundation. Um, we had that happen multiple times. And so just know um, that you should also be in contact with whatever foundations you are uh, partner with already. Um, let them know what you need. We even split some grants. If I remember correctly, COVID gave half the grant and then like another foundation paid the other half. And so foundations are doing their regular grant making in addition to applying to the uh, support the COVID fund. And so we make sure that we share everything that comes in with our other grantee, with our other funding partners to see if there's a potential fit. Um, and we are definitely going to be funding Pat into 2021. We have set a, a year long um, grant period for this. And so right now we're funding through at least summer of 2021, assuming we have enough dollars left to do that. Um, we just didn't put the dates up yet. Um, for the grant cycles for 2021, but we will put that on our on our website as we get closer. Yeah. Internet connectivity is definitely seen as a basic need. Um, we have funded a number of technology grants. Just know that there's also a digital equity coalition. That, that um, issue was so important to so many different groups. It was such a widespread issue. We set up a separate coalition, funding coalition to support that work. And so they have started and the Cleveland Foundation and many others, there must be 60 different groups, the county, the city, everybody is, a lot of people are involved in that, in that, organ, in that uh, collaboration. And they are thinking short-term and long-term also like us. Short-term, they've been getting uh, PCs and hotspots out to students. And now I think starting with people who are looking for work and then also seniors, they're also getting hotspots out to them. They're also thinking long-term with the state around how to build better um, connectivity in general across our region, which is we have a, we're very poor in terms of the, that issue. So just know that sometimes uh, technology grants will come to the COVID fund. We might not fund it. We might give it off to the Digital Equity Coalition and they can fund it. We're kind of going back and forth on that as, as, and, and iterating in real time to see what, what matches which uh, fund better. Yes, we've definitely had a number of people come uh, apply to us for both technology needs for their clients to reach their clients for their own back office so that they can do better um, with what they have to have to deal with in COVID. We've definitely had people apply for that. I can take the next um, couple yeah. here. I see one question. Can you explain the agency budget parameters again? If an agency has a budget of $40 million, for example, but the program for which um, re request, excuse me, support is requested is less than $20 million, can you apply to the fund? Uh, we are encouraging organizations with budgets, with operating budgets less than $20 million to apply to the fund. Um, is that a hard and fast rule? No, 
uh, it, the times are, are so hectic and so chaotic that we couldn't possibly um, make any hard and fast rules, frankly. However, um, our general orientation to a lot of this is that for those larger organizations, um, they're not experiencing COVID necessarily in the same way, and they may have, they are likely to have um, budget flexibility in the ways that our relatively small organizations do not. So our focus will be on those smaller organizations under 20 million, um, but certainly you're welcome to contact us um, at that email address at the bottom of the screen, and we'd be happy to, to kind of talk one-on-one -on -one with you. I see a couple others here. Will volunteering on the community advisory committee make my organization unable to apply for a grant? Um, I will say, I will answer this with a little bit of an asterisk um, in that we haven't yet devised fully what that community advisory committee will look like. And our strategy team, neither Dale nor I individually, but the strategy team, that group of 15 or 17 folks is going to be building that out. I, my guess is that, that the answer is no, that serving on the community advisory committee would not preclude your organization from applying for a grant for a variety of reasons. But we've even said that at the outset in terms of the strategy team. Um, the folks who are, we do have a process for conflicts of interest. For example, those who are reviewing grants are to um, abstain if they serve on a board of a nonprofit, et cetera. But by and large, those who are not directly reviewing the grants um, are not precluded. And even those that are reviewing grants uh, simply must abstain. There is no process for um, you know, being declined access to apply. Um, I see uh, a question here. Are grantees who received neighborhood connection subgrants for non-pandemic related projects considered previous grantees? I'll take yeah. a first stab at this as well, and the answer should be no. Right. Um, is paid leave for staff members exposed to COVID who must quarantine an eligible expense? Um, I will take again a first stab. This is not a question that we've necessarily considered. Um, my guess is that the answer regrettably would likely be no. Um, for a variety of reasons. Paid leave is something that came up um, loudly and clearly in our strategic planning process, but it's something that we've situated most likely in our long-term recovery strategy as an advocacy opportunity. There are simply too many people, frankly, who are sick and too many nonprofits for us to possibly be able to, to deploy a $3 million fund. We could easily expend the $3 million fund in a week um, for that particular expenditure. So I would suspect that it wouldn't be funded, but we can certainly check with the strategy team and get back to you on that. Dale, you wanna take the next few here? Yeah, definitely. Um, so any, anybody wanting, question, wanting answers around the size of your budget, if you're over 20 million, you should call us. We're, everything is on a case by case basis. Um, we have let a few in, most we have not, um, for all sorts of reasons, um, mostly because they have other resources to rely on. But we are, we are trying really hard to not do what foundations normally do, which we, we set one parameter and we use that for everybody. Um, we are really trying to take this on a case-by-case -case basis. So if you have questions about the size of your budget and whether you qualify, you should call us. Um, there is not a separate application form for the Digital Equity Coalition. You should submit right now, we'll figure that out. You should submit to us and we can send it over to them. But just know literally right now, if you know somebody who needs a computer or a hotspot, they have extra computers and hotspots right now that they can get out to you tomorrow. <laughs> um, so any of your clients or your residents um, or people that you know who need that, um, especially if they're students, but even if they're not students, um, and by the way, when we say students, we don't just mean CMSD students. The Digital Equity Coalition is supporting all students in Cuyahoga County. Well, in Cleveland and the inner ring suburbs first, I believe. Um, but it's not just CMSD students, it's not just Catholic students, it's any student um, in, in that region. Yeah, I just wanna clarify, Dale, for folks, um, you said they should reach out to you personally, like Cleveland Foundation, or they should reach out no, to No, they them? should call our response website. I mean, uh, uh, so that you can, we have our consultants who are helping field all questions to the response fund. Great. Um, you have mentioned different work groups with different focuses. If one applies now, can we apply for the other work groups if they are applicable also during this grant period? Um, as far as we know, again, those things are still in process, but I can't imagine that there would necessarily be a restriction. Again, the first phase, this first work group is based on response and pressing needs, those unmet basic needs and other issues that have, ar have arisen directly as a result of COVID. That second work group is about adaptation and, and resilience within the nonprofit sector. The third phase, again, is 
related to policy and advocacy, but focused on a whole issue, a whole set of issues around dismantling structural racism, focusing on economic mobility and well-being. Um, and, the, and again, those those two latter work groups will be um, not necessarily the same type of application process you would experience in the response work group. Thank you. We've had a, a number of questions around adult students in workforce development programs. I do know that the Digital Equity Coalition, that is a target population for them. They call them strivers, um, people who are looking. Um, we have given, in fact, the COVID fund gave some money to one organization, I can't remember where, I think, um, okay, I'm gonna forget her group, um, to support those types of, those types of students. So it, um, the Digital Equity Coalition is definitely at some point getting to that group. I need to check on the timing of it. Um, but if that's something that um, is a need, you should apply to the COVID fund and we can definitely send that over to them if we won't be able to do it. Um, you can apply for technology support for adult students in workforce development programs. We do know that is a big problem. This is an economic issue in addition to a healthcare issue. Did we get through all the questions? Oh my gosh, that can't be. <laughs> that was rapid fire. I know. We still have a few, a few minutes here. If, if other folks have a question, feel free to put it in the little Zoom chat. Are you aware of any collaborative efforts from agencies serving individuals experiencing homelessness? I just got off a call about that this morning. <laughs> um, uh, we, the COVID fund is working with the county um, and a number of, of homeless service organizations. Literally, we just had our first meeting today um, to think through what are the longer term strategies. Well, inter intermediate and longer term around dealing with homelessness during this pandemic. Um, we worked with the county in the, I think that was one of our first grants to help depopulate the homeless shelters. We are continuing to talk to them. Uh, the county has actually given the COVID fund a special set of dollars to focus on this, but we're not as, as in, as with phase two in general, we're not just having funders at the table discussing this. We've invited nonprofit partners to the table to think through both just in the next like three months, what are we doing? And then could we set this up as a longer term plan for homelessness? So yes, it's definitely on the table. It's one of our new adaptive work groups um, and more to come on that. Okay. Um, oh, the Q and A button. Yeah, there's, there's questions in two. Uh, a separate oh. button. I was only looking at the chat, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got them all. Yes, a recording of the session will be available on the website on the Cleveland Foundation, um, where they, there's the, the landing page for the COVID fund. So people, that's why we recorded it. So people will be able to see this and you can go back. Um, oh, someone said, thank you for all you are doing. Thank you. Um, we're trying. Um, and and we, we have the easy job, right? I mean, we're, we're putting in long hours. Uh, we yeah. won't deny that. This is, this is a 24 hour thing and weekends especially. And I, I now have the reputation of sending texts after 11, a, uh, after 11 p.m. and before 7 a.m. and I don't regret yes. it. Um, so we are working hard, but we know you all are working even harder at the front lines of this pandemic. So thank you, seriously. And I would just say, you know, what I, one thing I wanna reiterate is if you already have a relationship with one of our foundations locally, you should stay in touch with them. There are a lot of different things that we're trying to think of doing um, in our individual foundations and then also through the COVID fund. One thing we are doing very differently is we are sharing information in real time with all of our funding partners. That's one of the things we learned. Philanthropy has had to look at itself during this pandemic. We, sh we um, purport to be experts. No one's an expert in this. We have to share information in real time with our, fund with our grantee partners, with residents, so that we can all work together to come up with solutions to something that none of us have faced before. And so I would say, please be in touch with your fellow uh, foundations that you already uh, are in partnership with. Be in touch with us as you see, as you see we're, we're gonna make an announcements every couple of weeks of what we're funding. If you start seeing there's a group missing, let us know. Um, we're trying our best with the dollars we have, but we also can advocate with our, our government partners that maybe there's a gap. Maybe there's something that people aren't fo focusing on. We want to know that. Um, so that if nothing else, we, we were told this in our evaluation, use your voice to elevate things that don't get elevated normally. And we are completely prepared and uh, ready to do that. Um, if nothing else, people will take our calls. <laughs> 
Um, we can't always get them to give money on the exact way we want them to. Um, but we are trying really hard as a group of foundations to work together to help us all get through this with our government partners. Dan, you want to close out? Sure. Uh, thank you again to everyone for taking time with us today. Thank you especially to the Cleveland Foundation for their extraordinary leadership for bringing us to the table. Um, and thank you also to our grantee partners, um, to all of you on the front lines doing the important work. We know this is not easy. I can hardly imagine, frankly, what you all are going through and we're just so grateful. Um, and then the last thing, of course, is thanks to our fund partners, the many that are at the table who are with us in phase one, who are with us again, those are with us again in phase two. Um, and, and we know that this is a time for unprecedented challenge, but it also offers us an an equally unprecedented opportunity to come together and do things that we wouldn't have otherwise done in the past. And we're excited uh, to continue showing up for our grantee partners. So thank you. Thank you. And please remember to wear your mask. Yes, amen. <laughs> Wash your hands. <laughs> Take care, everyone.